I just start. Okay. <laughs> okay. I didn't know if there was presentation. <laughs> <laughs> we have our class talk. Uh, we have Luis uh, Barado talking about the UNRU effect and hockey creation. Okay, thanks for the presentation. So, uh, yeah, thank you all for staying till so late. I hope you have some energy left for my talk after the marathon of today. So, yeah, I'm gonna briefly comment what is the. Okay. Uh, about on the results on, in two works that I did in collaboration with these other people, mostly from Vienna and from other institutions. Uh, on uh, the two, I would say, most relevant uh, effects of, uh, of quantum field theory in carbon space, the uh, Ulrich effect and Hawking radiation, but considered instead of uh, in the usual situation where you consider these effects as perceived by observers that uh, or, or typically you in, with the use of quantum detectors as is uh, quantum particle detectors as is customary in, uh, in quantum field theory in carbon space. Uh, instead of using the standard approach, well, we will consider these uh, detectors to be in a quantum superposition of trajectories, right? Uh, and well, let's see what comes out and how these effects are perceived in, in, and, and can be uh, can be addressed in, in this uh, different scenario. So, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, just uh, as a very brief comment on why this should be interesting. Well, basically, um, one, can, one shall notice that in quantum field theory in capital space, already changing the reference frame classically, typically to an accelerated reference frame, yields interesting results, the UNRU effect, right? Uh, vacuum of a quantum field as perceived by inertial observers suddenly happens to be perceived as a thermal bath by accelerated observers. So, uh, change of reference frames in general is something non-trivial when we are handling a quantum field. Uh, and on the other side, we have that there is a developing theory on quantum reference frames, mostly in, in, uh, non-relativistic, uh, where one is trying to understand what happens and what, how the perception of certain quantum system changes when you jump into reference frames that are quantum. So the idea is why not try to combine all these things together and see what happens when one considers quantum field theory but changes of reference frame that are not between classical reference frames but between quantum reference frames. And these works are in, aligned in, in this direction and are first say a little bit phenomenological approach in that direction. So briefly revising the, the, what I may call the standard room effect. If you have a, a quantum field, we consider a massive scalar field in Minkowski space-time, and you prepare it in, in a, 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 the field is in the vacuum state for, for inertia observers, Minkowski vacuum. Then if you consider this field as, as described by accelerated observers, this is the expression of this state, vacuum state, uh, but in the, in the basis natural to the accelerated observers or in, in, in Rindler modes, one finds out that this is actually a plan it has a Planckian spectrum with temperature proportional to the, to the acceleration, right? And, and this can be seen like that as a, as a re expression of the state. But another typical approach in quantum field theory in carbon space is to consider particle detectors. For example, if we put a particle detector following this hyperbolic trajectory in Mikonsky, which is a accel constant accelerating trajectory, and we couple it to the field, we will find that it will get excited uh, as if it was perceiving a thermal bath with temperature proportional to the acceleration. So, um, uh, but as I said, we are not going to consider just one trajectory fixed, but we are considering a particle detector. Here's a detector with different uh, energy gaps, right, internal degrees of freedom, and we are going to put it in a quantum superposition of different, um, of different uh, trajectories, right? So it's going to be not just in one fixed trajectory, but we are going to consider a quantum superposition of, for example, these three trajectories or any others. So we have states for the internal degrees of freedom, a basis for the external degrees of freedom that describes the trajectory, and we make it the detector to interact with the, with the field. I'm not going to go in depth into the details of the interaction. This is basically interaction time that makes 
the detector to interact with the field. The field, of course, evaluated in a position which is an operator itself because it will be dependent on the trajectory. And then we prepare the, the initial state of the whole thing where our detector is not excited, the field is in the vacuum state, and we prepare a quantum superposition of trajectories. Here is the quantum superposition of, of the different trajectories with different coefficients. We we run the experiment, see what happens in first order perturbation theory, and this is what happens. Forget about handling all the details, I will, I will go through what is truly important. Once we trace out the field, because we are interested on what is the detector perceiving, um, and, and we measure the, we also measure the external degrees of freedom of, of the detector, namely the trajectory, and we just try to see what is left for the internal degrees of freedom for the energy levels and how the detector got excited, which is giving us the information of what the detector perceived about the field. We found out, well, first there's a first term which has to do with, with the detector not getting excited because we are running first order perturbation theory. And then we get these terms, which if you see, the important thing is that they are uh, diagonal in the energies and they have a Planckian spectrum. This is a standard Unruh effect, right? With, uh, with the different accelerations that we have considered, just completely incoherently mixed. So this is something to be expected, no? A standard Unruh effect should be a, an, um, a specific result of this more general approach. So if we had found just this contribution, we wouldn't have published any article because this would be trivial. But we find also this other contribution, which, in which coherences are left between different, this is non-diagonal, off-diagonal terms, uh, for the state of internal degrees of uh, internal energy levels of the detector. Uh, and this means that there are coherences left in the internal, uh, inter in the internal energy levels. And they also follow a, a Planckian spectrum and there are two important things. Not they appeared conditioned to some condition that I will I will comment right now, and they are weighted by this quantity that I will also comment now. So just remember, this is these are the, the relevant novel terms appearing, and they are appeared with a condition and weighted by a factor. First, the condition. When do they appear? Well, they appear between two different energy levels, if the quotient between the energy levels and two different accelerations along two different trajectories happens to coincide, right? This is, this is the condition, right? What does that mean physically? Well, it means that if you think of it of what you are trying to, to think of what happens along each trajectory that you are going to interfere later on, Basically, if the detector went through this trajectory and got excited to some certain energy level, and, or either went through that trajectory and got excited to another energy level, if this condition holds for these two cases, it means that the, that the particle that the detector absorbed from the, from the thermal body it is perceiving is the degenerating energy, because you have to correct between one trajectory and another by the Tolman factor of this non-trivial Greenland metric. So basically this condition entails that the energy of the detected particle by the, by the detector should be degenerating in energy for at least two of the trajectories we are considering. Right? And the second aspect is that these off-diagonal terms come with a come weighted by, by this quantity, which is actually a scalar product between, of, between the state of the fields left through a given trajectory and through another given trajectory. And this is take this shape that I'm going to explain right now. This is a comparison between two trajectories, and this would be the distance between the trajectories uh, in, the, in the Rindler wedge along the direction uh, parallel to the acceleration, and this would be the distance along the direction perpendicular to the acceleration between two given trajectories. And this would be the point where the trajectories coincide, right? 
and, and the farther you go from here, the more distant the trajectories are in the accelerated reference frame, right? So the more distant the trajectories are, this, this weight that the, um, that the off-diagonal terms have tends to vanish, which basically means that in order to have some coherences left between the different uh, energy levels, the trajectories you are considering should, should stay close to one another, right? And this is for very low, this is a, the weight for very low energies, higher energies, higher energies, and, and much higher energies, right? The, the, the size of the region where this weight is significantly, it has, gets some non, almost vanishing values, becomes smaller the higher the energies. What is a physical interpretation of that that we find, that we consider? Well, basically, um, any time the detector gets excited in the accelerated, in the initial reference frame, one can check that what it does is to emit a Mikonsky particle. But in the accelerated reference frame, what it does is to absorb a particle from the thermal bath it is perceiving, right? And it can be the case that the particle that you absorb um, along one trajectory when you get excited to some certain energy level and the particle, they are not fully distinguishable. This means that the footprint you are leaving, the effect you are having on the field along different trajectories and for different energy levels is not fully distinguishable. This means you are not fully entangled with the field. This means that when you trace the field out, you are not fully decohered. So this is what is going on. It is not always the case that, uh, that you get full decoherence with the field, right? And in this sense, you have first a condition for not get fully decoherent is that these two situations, they are degenerating energy, or the wiser particles that you are swallowing from the field would be fully distinguishable. This is one condition. And the other conditions that the trajectories should be closer, they are somehow giving us the physical idea that the, that the particles are absorbed around the trajectories in some region. The particles, the shape of the particles that you absorb is around your trajectory, right? Uh, and if the trajectories happen to be closer, then the, the two situations, as I said, are not fully distinguishable. So somehow these previous graphs that seem to be like these previous graphs, we may call them the shape of a Rindler particle for different energies, right? One in, in this specific interpretation that I'm considering, right? Uh, um, this is uh, this is a result from the Unruh case. I didn't mention at the beginning. Sorry, I was going to go into more detail in the case of the Unruh effect because basically, uh, in the case of Hawking radiation, for um, the the procedure is basically analogous, right? Here is a uh, case of the um, of the Hawking radiation in the case of a Svashiba hole, the the field is also a massive scalar field and so on, um, and and the interaction term is the same. So that's why I went into more details in the in the former case. And what we consider here is a quantum superposition of the detector being in different positions, static positions outside the black hole, right? We beam split the detector and we consider a quantum superposition of being it either here or here or there with, with different coefficients, yes, in, as in the case of, of the Unruh effect. Um, again, the procedure is analogous. I'm not going to go into the, into the details, also because of, of time. Uh, but we can comment. Here, in, in the first thing is that in, in a Svashi black hole, one needs to, uh, to choose the vacuum, and it's not, it's not so unique or not so trivial to choose, yes, as in Mikonsky, the Mikonsky vacuum state, because you have more choices that have, are physically meaningful. So we considered, yeah, I'm almost done. Uh, we considered two paradigmatic cases. First, the Hawking vacuum state, where the, where the black hole is in thermal equilibrium with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the outside, right? So you have a thermal bath of temperature given by the Hawking temperature, no emission, just a thermal equilibrium. 
And in this case, this is the analogous of these uh, other, uh, other um, uh, graph that I put for the Umbra effect, where here we are comparing the coherences left in the case of two trajectories that are separated. This is separation in the radial direction and this is separation in angle, right? So from i to minus pi and in the radial direction, right? Uh, I, I didn't mention you get exactly the same uh, condition on that, the, that the, you have to have the degeneracy in energy in order to find coherences. And then the coherences are weighted by this quantity. Um, and yeah, this would be again the shape of a particle of a hot Hawking vacuum, of the hot Hawking vacuum state in these given coordinates. This is typically the tortoise coordinate around some point where you have placed uh, your detector. It's curious to see that you get quite a peak of, the, of coherence when you put a quantum superposition of trajectories, each one in the opposite side of the, of the black hole. It's just a numerical result, you get it, that's what you find. We didn't find any special reason why this should be or not be the case, but this is what comes out. Um, and the other case of vacuum that we considered, uh, there, are, there are much more results. You can, you can take a look to the, uh, to the, um, to the article for, for seeing much more details. We, com we have to take here into account also gray body factors and other things, but I didn't want to go into these technical details. The other, um, the other situation that we consider is the Umbu vacuum state, uh, which is the vacuum state where the, part, where the black hole is emitting radiation, right? Hawking radiation, the state which is supposed to be left after a uh, stellar collapse, um, forming a black hole. And here one can see that one finds out that the coherences are, are kept much, high, much higher when you consider comparing trajectories that one is uh, the farther away you take the trajectories. Basically this is because here we cannot interpret anymore since we don't have a, 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 a thermal bath but rather a thermal flux. You, it can be the case that the, the perturbation you do in the field here is not as much distinguishable as the, the, the perturbation you do in the field there, there because all what matters is how you perturb the field in the asymptotic region and you can do a, a much more similar perturbation because all what matters is, is, is the flag. This, this, this uh, vacuum is, is defined actually in the, in the, in the null future in, uh, infinity, right? So, yeah, one can uh, interpret now this not just as a shape of a particle because you don't have a bath, but rather as the perturbation you do in the radiation of the, of the black hole as seen in the asymptotic region, and that's why you get this different behavior. Uh, a brief comment on further works. We are considering very similar situations for cosmological particle creation and scenarios where you, we start also to put quantum superpositions of detectors. Uh, and we would like also to think about not only in terms of particle detectors, but another tool that is used in quantum field theory in carbon space, which is Bogolikov transformations. See if one can also generalize these in, in a similar sense. And finally, try to handle situations where you not only have quantum superpositions of observers or of trajectories of particle detectors, but also uh, quantum superpositions of metrics themselves and try to see if one can compare one thing with, with the, the current work that we do with, with these situations. And with this, I'm done. Thanks.